Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing a book review. I hope to do these relatively often. I love books and I find them a really useful tool in my work and when I find a good book I really like to share it before placing it on my perfectly colour coordinated bookshelves which people often ask about um, and I think people think I do it just to look pretty and they do look pretty um, but it's also because it's the only way I can ever find things. I can never think of the title or the author I can just think Oh, it's green. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the book I'm going to be um, reviewing today is, uh, it's a tough read. Um, it's called Things John Didn't Know About and it's published by Jessica Kingsley Publishing. It's written by um, a lady called Sue Henderson who has worked for 25 years as, so as a social worker um, and who lost her husband to suicide 15 years ago. And it's a mix of a very personal experience. She shares very openly the time that she and her family have gone through since the death of her husband, um, as well as really drawing on um, kind of best practice and the research around grief and bereavement um, and managing that. And also thinking about practical things like how to work with the school, how to talk to your child about death and bereavement. Um, I'm going to read a few different bits from the book to give you a bit of a flavour for it. Um, I'll display the contents now, um, so um, I'll get some PDFs from the uh, publishers and we'll put those up so you can see them nice and clearly. Um, so yeah, and this isn't a sales pitch, it's just a book that I think is quite unique um, and would be useful for a lot of the people who are interested in my channel. So it's primarily being marketed at people who are in this situation, so parents who have lost a partner to suicide, but actually I think it is so much more widely used useful than that. I think this would be useful if you were working in a school and you had a young person in the school who had lost a parent to suicide. I think it would be useful if you were within the wider family, so the grandparents or cousins or aunts and uncles, you know, anyone where that there's been a loss through suicide. Um, I think it's also quite useful to read, it's one of those moments, uh, I found it hard but really useful to read as a parent who has attempted suicide, seeing the impact that John's suicide had on his family um, and the ways in which the ripples were felt for many years and so deeply has really, I think, helped me. To, it'll, be a, it'll be a resource I will draw on myself if I come to difficult times again. So yeah, if you, if you feel suicidal ever and you're a parent, I think this is a, a really useful um, thing to add to your armory to help you realise that even when you think your family might be better off without you that you know would help you to question that um, and then more widely I think it would be useful for people like um, GPs, social workers, anyone who might be coming into contact with families in this circumstance not least because you might want to read it so that you can recommend it there's not a huge amount of really good solid support um, for people out there in this situation there are lots of charities um, and there are some kind of official guides and things um, but this is so special because it's written as a first person account and granted uh, Sue's story is just Sue's story but she has worked so hard to create a really useful resource here um, so it starts off um, with the scenario and you begin you know you get thrown straight in there with thinking how awful this must have felt um, John, my husband, took his own life at the age of 35. He left for work at 7.30 as usual. He kissed me and our two children, as usual. He told me he loved me, which was not usual, but that didn't occur to me until later. At 10.30, two police officers came to the door. I was changing our baby son's nappy. He was 19 days old. Our daughter, who was 27 months old, was with our childminder. I left the baby on the changing table to get the door. My first thought was that the police were in there in connection with the speeding ticket John had picked up three days previously, but I knew from their faces and the fact that there were two of them and that they would have known my husband would be at work and the creeping dread then filled me as I realised all of this in an instant that wasn't what they were there for. Um, and this kind of narrative, this kind of storytelling um, and sort of memoir type writing is maintained um, throughout this as Sue looks back over the 15 years and she looks very candidly at the highs as well as the lows. She does break off at, at points to look at things like the theories of grief and things like that um, and then it's told not quite so much in that first person although then she'll talk through how those applied to her. Um, 
Another useful extract, so this is from chapter two, which is a crash course in widowed single parenting, which is probably something that none of us ever wish to go through. And actually, this is something that also makes me realise another useful target audience for this book is not just those who've been widowed by suicide. Um, and although some of the stuff in here is very specific to that, actually, I think this would also be um, a really useful resource to someone who was widowed in any way as a parent and was left uh, raising the children without their, their partner who had died. Um, so yes, in those earliest weeks and months I did do it and found a way to make the time pass with lots of help from other people. But the long haul was round the corner and if I thought the early stages were challenging there was much worse to come. For a long time I wanted to run away or get in the car and drive without stopping. Not to get away from the children, nothing so specific, just a nebulous but overwhelming urge to be in this, to not be responsible for everything, to not have to keep coping with it all the time. But I knew I wouldn't because it wasn't an option. Confoundingly, there were huge amounts of joy mixed in with the exhaustion and relentlessness. I felt strong and proud at times when things were going well for the three of us, when we were having fun doing things together, although that was always tainted by a wish that John could be sharing it all with us. But whenever the children did something funny or clever, I'd think, wow, they're mine. And the gorgeousness of that wave of love always made up for the harder stuff. So this is kind of in the earlier days and Sue goes on to kind of explore those sorts of ups and downs of parenting. Um, and she is, you know, very open and honest that, yeah, this was, you know, there were good bits, there were bad bits, there were in-between bits, much as there is for anyone. But obviously, you know, she's facing somewhat different issues than others might. Um, on page 45, there's a really, um, I think, one of the most useful bits in the whole book, which is a list called, um, I'll, again, I'll put this up as a PDF, but uh, top tips for keeping it together. I won't read the full content, but I'll read the, the subhead so you can get an idea for the kind of uh, feel for what she's saying. So set achievable goals and plans. Number two, you don't have to be perfect. Number three, spend time with your children individually. Number four, Deal with troublesome toddler behaviour. Number five, get organised. Number six, ask friends or family for help if you can. Number seven, ignore the midnight voices. Number eight, keep things simple for the children. And number nine, take stock. And Again, many of those would be great advice for any parent in any scenario, but of course, Sue then goes on to look at this through the eyes of a parent bereaved by suicide and how she used this. Um, this chapter also includes advice to friends um, and looks at how you kind of um, would work with the school as well. Um, and Sue thinks variously through the book about what's the narrative that you should be sharing with the children, what's appropriate to share, what's not, and at what age and stage you should be having different conversations. Um, sometimes it is a very difficult read, um, particularly when Sue's reflecting on John not being there. Um, but she's quite pragmatic and doesn't, you know, she gets to a point through her research uh, that she doesn't really feel that things could have been different. And I think one of the things that can be really difficult is uh, endlessly going back over and thinking, what should we have done differently? How could this have turned out a different way? Um, I found this passage really moving. I wonder whether if John had known what his family's lives would end up being, he'd made a different decision. If he could have seen what it's like for the children without their dad, if he had known I hadn't ended up meeting someone else to share my life with, if he could have seen his parents' and brothers' pain. Most of the time, though, I don't really think he would have done anything differently, because what I understand about suicide is that there's little rational thought involved. For the person at the time, it seems like the clearest decision. And for John, I absolutely believe he thought it was the right decision, and the best one for us. I know it wasn't. But for him, who couldn't see a solution to whatever intractable problems he felt he was facing, it was the only way to resolve them. And I think it's quite remarkable, actually, that Sue is able to step back and look at things from her husband's point of view in that way. Um, but it does also bring to the fore, you know, uh, the different people who are affected over the time by his death um, and does make you yeah understand a bit more about the ripples um, that are the effects of suicide. 
Um, the final bit I want to share with you is actually written by John's son. So um, it was part of uh, an essay. So it says it's part of a, a story submitted as, um, as part of a higher English portfolio. Um, and this kind of gives you a bit of an idea of things from the point of view of the child uh, and a child who's gone through many years without their father and reflecting on life without their father. Um, and this is just a little bit of it. For a long time, I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed by a person who was no longer there, betrayed by a longer blame. All my life, I have been told that my dad loved me unconditionally and always, yet he left me. He walked out of the front door one morning and said goodbye to me, knowing that he was never coming back. I felt that he had abandoned me. And it's, it's yeah, so long and the short, I think it's a beautiful book. It's a heart-wrenching book. It's a book that draws on 25 years of social work experience. It's a book that draws on 15 years of as life as a parent bereaved by suicide. It's a book that draws on the ups and the downs of day-to-day -day life, living with a part of you missing every day. Um, and I think it's an important book to know about, to share, um, and I would highly recommend it. But just make sure that you have the Kleenex ready if you sit down to read it. Um, thank you to Sue Henderson for writing it. Um, if people are interested to know more about the book and about the author, I could try to arrange a Q&A with her. I don't know her, but I could get in touch with her via the publishers. So if that's something that you might be interested in, then let me know and let me know if you have any specific questions on this topic that we could use as part of a Q&A. If there's a demand for it, then I'm very, very happy to make that happen. Um, okay, so thanks for watching um, and I will review more books in future and if you like this, you find it helpful, please take a moment to give it a thumbs up, leave comments down below if you would like to have you know, the Q&A questions for the author, if you have other questions or comments or just want to let us know that you found this helpful um, and of course as ever if you would like to be kept up to date with my other videos please subscribe. Um, I hope this is helpful and I will see you again soon, bye bye.